Okay, so my region of our world is Disco's Archipelago. And Archipelago, obviously, it's uh, there's a central island and several other islands surrounding it. Uh, those islands are called the Eight Borders, while the central one is just the Disco's Island. Um, so, I have a legend that goes along with this, and I think it'd be easiest to go through that first. Um, Disco was a seafarer deity who discovered this island in which he found this really disgusting sulfur smell and a, a tribe of woven women and one chief who was just a magical. Uh, I won't I won't say if it's like a witch or something, but in essence, that's what it is. Um, Disco's ship was made of gold and silver clouds and was operated by a crew of nothing but limbs. His rowers were just arms. Um, the limbs that moved supplies around the ship were just legs, etc. Um, okay, so when Disco arrives on the island, he speaks to a tribeswoman and she says one thing to him, his one rule for being on the island is that he cannot create a fire. No fires whatsoever, and he can stay on the island and eat as much fruit as he desires. Well, Disco, in his sailor ways, gets a little annoyed if he can't have meat, because it's a more sustainable food than fruits and vegetables. Uh, so, he gets the hunger for meat, so he goes, he hunts an animal, and where exactly he goes to cook the animal is the top of this volcano. Because since the volcano is ever smoking, he believes that the tribe's woman will never know. Uh, so he walks up to the top of the volcano and there's this giant beast living just above the just above the the crevice of the volcano. And Disco goes up there and he wounds the beast with his sword. When he does that, the beast falls into the volcano and survives, but falls in anyway. Um, when he does this, his sword suddenly is capable of creating fire. His sword is constantly boiling hot. So he decides, okay, I'll go ahead and create my fire and cook my meat. Whenever he does that, um, he starts to create a fire at the tip of this volcano and it creates an explosion. A very loud, very big explosion. He's like, oh, and he's a deity, he survives. Um, so he's in a predicament now, okay. The tribe's woman definitely heard this, I'm going to leave the island. So he takes him, himself, his sword, leaves the meat, whatever. And he goes and tells the tribe's woman, hey, I am going to be leaving the island, and the tribe's woman says, okay. And she creates for him towels. Now, she weaves towels. Um, as Disco is about to leave, the tribe's woman presents the towels to him, and Disco said, or a chi, okay, not bad. She is presenting the towels to him along with a chalice in which, as a gift of wishing him to stay. Uh, he says, or she says, that the chalice will create wine whenever fruit is poured into it. He says, no thank you, and he gets ready to board his ship to leave. Well, the tribe's woman, before he can board the ship, pushes him into the ocean along with the towels. Now, the towels, being magical towels, um, create whirlpools around the island. 
thus making the island very difficult for any more travelers to come in and trapping Disco at the bottom of the ocean where he can no longer cook his meat and uh, he has to sustain himself off of raw fish, essentially. Before, um, Disco ends up leaving his sword on the island before he goes and falls into the ocean. And the tribeswoman goes ahead and throws the sword into the volcano. And when she does that, the beast at the bottom of the volcano ends up dying as a result. And lava flows out of the volcano, and it flows away from the east end, and flows to the west end. Wait, sorry, I got that in reverse. It flows to the east end, creating a warmer climate. And now I'm starting to get into like the actual island's topography and climate, whatever. Um, the east end of the island has more fish in it because it creates a warmer climate for fish to be in. That, that's why it's named the Sea of Plenty. And on the other side, it is the Sea of Little because obviously there's a little amount of uh, fish and living in it. All right. So, this island today, the volcano is a resource for black powder, gunpowder, etc. And there's a route that goes directly to the from the volcano to this bay where there is a settlement and a growing industry, along with military, just arbitrary military, I didn't think about military, that's somebody else's job. Um, there is arbitrary military that has created a fort there, there's an installation, and there's only one way to get on the island by ship, which is to go to this border island here, which is, and then on this island there's a loading station, that will load off whatever cargo is on that ship and take it to the main island here. Um, there's also a pass right here that is very treacherous and dangerous between this border island and the rest of the whirlpools. And I don't know if I made it clear, but the border islands and the whirlpools make this, uh, it makes the borders of the, of the archipelago. Um, uh, sandy beaches, thick jungle area. This is a very new development in whatever world we're doing this in. And I would say that makes it something. Yes. Question? Okay. So you're saying one half of the island has more water and that's where all the fish are? Yeah, it's warmer water because it's an active volcano. Yeah. I understand that. Um, does the magic how the water to the other side of the island? Well, it's more present in this area because it's a constantly flowing volcano. Okay. And, and it, by this point, it cools off. Okay. Once it's out of the volcano, it rapidly cools off, but it creates a warmer climate here than here. Okay. Yeah. I was just curious. Are all the islands habitable? Are they all habitable? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, this main one on its uh, west side, definitely. That's where the settlement is. Um, other islands, not so much. They're more sandbars, if anything else. This island right here does have the loading station, but I would assume that whoever works there would eventually just take a ferry back to the main island. And uh, whoever wants this tablet I made for, I don't know who's going to be making my people. Me. Do you, okay. Do you want this? Sure. Okay. Well, I, I, love, I love the idea of the ship. That was awesome. <laughs> so, you do the markers. Do what you will up there. I like that the dangerous uh, passage is helpful as And. Let's get into Gomer's travels. So how many of you already had some familiarity with Gulliver's travels before this course? At least with the idea of it. Okay, you did? Anybody else? Okay, who else did? 
Uh, so how many of you were familiar on some level with Bellinger's Travels before this class? Okay, just about everybody, right? I mean, Jack Black. Okay. Yeah, the, yeah. Yeah, the Jack Black. Movie. Okay, yeah, that, that is a thing that exists. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, any other context in which you've already encountered some of this material? Uh, not so much, yeah, not really in the novel, right? Um, and not really Jonathan Swift either. Um, I guess maybe, I didn't, I never actually saw the Jack Black movie. Is that kind of what happens in that? Oh, I'm, I'm talking about Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. So he does have, so he has a financial crisis. Well, Gulliver has a financial crisis that sends him out to see. Um, yeah, uh, but, uh, yeah, um, so the Jack Black movie is a thing where, like, I, I remember as a kid seeing cartoon versions um, of Gulliver's Travels, right? like, like, you know, um, animated shorts or animated films. And I don't, again, like, I didn't see the Jack Black movie. Does it deal with more than one of the voyages or it's just, just those? Okay. Yeah. yeah, pretty much all popular media that deals with Gulliver's Travels really only covers part one. Yeah. And I was like, wait, this is the whole like, movie. Yeah, yeah, so wait, this is part one, but he leaves, yeah. And then there's more. So yeah, so yeah, part one is the voyage to Lilliput. And what's weird about the Lilliputians? Tiny, yes, they're about six inches tall, right? Yeah. So here we're dealing with tiny people. Part two is the voyage to Brobdignag. And the Brobdignagians are giants. So in many ways, this kind of reverses a lot of the tropes of the voyage to Lilliput, right? And so the, the Lilliputians are tiny and see everything from the perspective of a tiny person who has to look at things very close up. Um, the Brodignagians are giants and are looking at everything from a great distance, right? Um, this also changes Gulliver's position relative to the island he's the islanders he's visiting, right? In Lilliput he's a giant. In Brobdignag, he's about the size of a little creature. Right, relative to the animals. Right, part three. Part three is a kind of grab bag of episodes, right? There are uh, a variety of islands he visits. Um, there's one that's full of philosophers, one that's inhabited by necromancers. <laughs> yeah, damp air. It's a, you can just put it under the table here for now. And weirdly, he also visits Japan. Right, so one real place in the midst of all of these fictional places, right? And then part four, which we're going to be doing Next time is the voyage to Wyndham Land, which, as we stated before class, is inhabited by talking horses. So we're only going to be looking at part one and part four here. We're going to be more or less ignoring the parts in the middle. But we're still probably going to see a lot of parallels between um, these two different voyages, right? So one thing, um, how did reading this go for y'all? What did y'all think of this? <laughs> oh. It was entertaining. Okay, was that, what, was, what was entertaining about it? Well, like, with the Lily. 
Lilliputians. Yeah, Lilliputians. They're down. They had all these weird rules and like uh -huh. laws, like it was to be um, deceitful and worse than the thief. Uh huh. The queen, the prince, catch on fire and kill the king. Okay, yeah, there there is an unusual amount given other things we've read of piss and shit in this, yeah. right? <laughs> There's like emphasis on bodily functions. Yeah. Just weird. So that's something that we'll cover. And I think a thing to remember too, like when we're talking about like the the emphasis on bodily functions and things of the body, right? How does Gulliver appear to the Lilliputians? How is he physically different from them? Yeah, he's enormous compared to them, right? So, so are his various functions, right? So yes, yeah, so all, all of these are kind of described in terms of enormity, right? You know, he needs he needs two Lilliputian servants to cart his shit away, right? You know, it doesn't occur to him that the Empress of Lilliput, when he taken a miss, when he, you know, since it's like pees a river on her apartments um, <clears throat> to put out a fire, right? So yeah, one thing to note with anything to do with the body in this, right, is this quality of hugeness that is attached to it. Um, Carrington, you were about to say something too, so no. what were you going to say? Um, like a lot of their stuff, like, we, like I found comical, they uh -huh. were like being serious, and yeah. like, I thought that was interesting. Uh-huh. Um, so, so, sorry, are you like the various things that the government ministers have to do and all that sort of thing? Like, yeah, let's, let's look at, that, at some of those like little, like those, like government rituals, right? What are some examples of this? What are some of the things that the government ministers do to, say, get their posts or to curry favor? Dance on the bread. Yeah, they're going to dance on a tightrope, right? Right? You get and maintain your position by demonstrating how well you can dance on a tightrope. And then how do you receive special honors from the emperor? Being a good person, like by not being Well, th does that actually seem to work out in practice? The Lilliputians have a lot of rules and laws that Gulliver approves as good, right? But these people often seem pretty deceitful in practice, right? What about the thing, the thing for which the, gov the emperor gives out little bits of string? What does he give out the little bits of string as prizes for? Right, basically, you know, he, he holds out a stick and raises it or lowers oh, it. Oh, yeah. jump over the high Yeah, you, yeah exactly. Yeah, you have to jump over or, or go under a stick. And if you do, successfully, then you get one of these little colored threads, right? So you get colored threads, right, which represent high honors. For either jumping, or like successful limbo, right? The idea here being, right, that in order to get a government position in the first place, right, you have to be able to walk a kind of delicate balance between maintaining your integrity and keeping the emperor happy. And in order to get honors from the emperor, you have to behave kind of according to his whims, right? If he wants you to jump over the stick, you're going to have to jump over it. If he wants you to crawl under it, you're going to have to crawl under it. 
you're going to have to do it at the level he's at the level he suggests, right? So, <clears throat> Lilliputian government practice. Yeah, go ahead, Ash. What were you going to say? Like this constant, you know, you get your status on the couldn't we say this is also similar to what government, at least during this time, was like in uh -huh. England? You know, mm -hmm. your yeah. status fell or rose at the pleasure of honor. Yeah, to degree. exactly. And yeah, that's, that's actually uh, one of the things I'm actually gonna, uh, about to, to get at here is that this is usually read, at least this first part of the book is usually read as a political allegory, which. Um, kind of uh, deals with political life in England at the beginning of the 18th century. So let's start there, since that's the usual critical approach, and then we'll try to like, like talk a little bit more about the fantastic elements um, as we go forward, right? So, Swift, In the early 18th century, is a Church of Ireland clergyman. So the Church of Ireland was just the Irish branch of the Church of England. Right? So what this means is that he, yeah, he's an Anglican priest, he's an Anglican clergyman but in Ireland rather than in England. The Church of Ireland was a slightly separate body that was governed by slightly different rules. So, <clears throat> Swift is able to ingratiate himself with members of a political party called the Tories, right? So, the big political parties in 18th century England were the Tories and the Whigs. So the Tories were royalist, right? That is, they were the party that kind of upheld the ideas of royal authority and tended to be supportive of the traditional prerogatives of the aristocracy. So they were conservative in the small c sense, right? And they also tended to be uh, what was called high church Anglicans. So high church Anglicans preferred for the church to be a little bit closer to uh, Catholicism in practice and in ritual, right? So they envisioned kind of a much more formal church with a more formal hierarchy and authority structure um, and a lot more incense and robes and things like that, right? The Whigs, on the other hand, were the party of the upper middle class. So, you know, people who were landed, but you know, people who owned land but maybe didn't have a title, um, you know, people who um, were like important business interests in the cities, things like that, right? And the Whigs, in addition to tending to want more power for parliament and less for the monarch, tended to be low church. And a low church position within the Anglican church brings it like closer to what we would refer, like the way we would think of, um, say, evangelical Protestant churches, right? That, that don't have very strong authority structures, um, that are a bit more kind of democratically governed, and where there isn't um, a lot of, um, there isn't a lot of ritual or symbolism, typically, right? There might be like a bare cross on the wall, but the church itself is rarely all that adorned. Um, the minister is just like, lead, is basically just a worship leader, things like that, right? 
So this is Swift's party, the Tories. And the Tories are in power in England from about 1710 to 1714. Swift actually sort of works as a secretary for several important um, Tory politicians. And one of the major things happening in Europe at the time is what's called the War of the Spanish Succession. Has anyone ever heard of the War of the Spanish Succession? I'm not entirely surprised we don't really talk about it a lot. Um, although it actually does have some bearing on US history. So the Spanish king, Charles II, known as the Bewitched or the Accursed uh, because of his uh, severe physical and intellectual disabilities, um, somehow manages uh, to live well into adulthood, but then dies without producing an heir. And you know, it's kind of discovered why uh, after he dies, they're going to do an autopsy and discover that he had like, you know, one triple blackened testicle. So probably why no heir, right? Um, so that was probably a detail you didn't need, but there you go. Thank you for that. Later. Um, so. When Charles dies without an heir, this sets off a uh, war across Europe as different claimants try to take the Spanish throne, right? And one reason for this is we may have mentioned this before, uh, but if not, it bears mentioning it in, uh, in any way. Um, royal families in Europe weren't usually very closely related to the people they ruled but they were all very closely related to each other through intermarriage, right? So, in a way, they kind of formed a nationality unto themselves. Uh, so, most of the rulers of Europe are cousins. And many of them have as good a claim to the Spanish throne as any others, right? So, what ends up happening, the upshot of this for understanding Gomer's travels, is that in 1713, the Tory government agrees to a treaty that is called the Peace of Utrecht. So called because it's signed in the Dutch city of Utrecht. Right? Now, this treaty offers some major territorial concessions in North America to the French and also puts a French king on the Spanish throne, though he has to then renounce any claim he might have to the French throne. Yeah, go ahead. Let's say, let's say 1713 piece of blank. Utrecht, U-T-R-E-C-H-T. Um, so, does anybody know how the British and the French have typically felt about each other in story? Yeah, yeah. They, they have been like made. They were major geopolitical rivals, right? And they often um, got on quite poorly. Uh, so the Whig faction in Parliament comes to power after this treaty is signed, and they arrest and try several of the Tory leaders for treason, accusing them of having collaborated with the French secretly to produce a treaty that was in opposition to English interests and that favored the French, right? So here's how this political allegory works in terms of the voyage to Liverpool. So Lilliput is England. Right? Because in an allegory, right, everything stands for something else outside of the text, right? 
Lilliput's rival, Lefuscu, is France. Did anybody, does anybody recall what the controversy was over the eggs? Uh, the low heels and high heels. Okay, yeah, they're the low heels and the high heels. Yeah, 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 yeah we, we, we can actually cover the low heels and the high heels first because that actually refers directly to political parties here, right? So the Tories are the high heels because high church and the Whigs are the low heels because low church. And we're told the emperor wears low heels, right? Because the king of England at the time, George I, had aligned himself with the Whigs. Yeah, his son hasn't made up his mind yet, so he wears one, one high heel and one low heel and kind of walks, like, kind of hobbles around, right? But yeah, what about the eggs? The Lilliputians yeah, the the crack on the smaller end and the Lilliputians uh, crack on the bigger end. And this came back from the Lilliputian king uh -huh. cut his finger. Yeah. We have the little enders and the big enders, right? And the big enders run away to Blefuscu where they're protected rather than staying in Lilliput where they're persecuted. So this refers actually to both a political and a religious dispute, because most religious disputes are also on some level political, right? So the Little Enders are Anglicans, right? And the disputes, or at least the, you know, the, the king's injury may refer um, to Henry VIII's inability to get a divorce, thus causing him to split from the Catholic Church. And the big enders then are Catholics, right, who still want to crack their, their they, still, they still want to crack their egg the old way, damn it. Um, but they're also potentially a political faction. called Jacobites. You know, you know what a Jacobite is, Ashley? Okay, go ahead. All right, Jacobite, what's a Jacobite? A Jacobite, um, Jacobites were Scottish Highlanders who rose up against English rule. Um, I'm trying to remember the exact, it was in the like, 1700s. Yeah, yeah so. Um, and they wanted Bonnie Prince Charles back in the world. Yeah, okay, so, so um, to kind of take that a little bit back to its, um, to its origins, right? So Jacobus in Latin is, uh, it's the Latin form of James. And in 1688, the Catholic King of England, James II, was deposed and replaced by his Protestant daughter, Mary, and her husband, the Dutch nobleman, William of Orange, right? So they become Mary II and William III. And James and his Catholic offspring, flee to France, where they live out the rest of their lives, um, plotting a return to power, right? And yeah, there are, uh, after, after, there are a couple of Jacobite risings throughout the 18th century in England, right? So this is something that is regarded um, as a particular threat, right? The French are nurturing this faction of traitors who may try to come back and impose themselves on England yet again, right? So this is the political allegory that's at work in a voyage to Liverpool, right? This is the immediate political situation that Swift finds himself in. He's, on the he's been on the losing side of this, right? So much of what he's doing tends to make the Whig side look bad and ridiculous. So for example, if we look at what Gulliver gets in trouble for it. How does he lose the emperor's favor? Part of it is peeing on the empress's quarters, right? That's, that seems to be relatively unforgivable. What else has he done, though, that has earned the displeasure of the emperor and other factions of court? 
What's he done in relation, excuse me, in relation to Blavatsky? Um, it asked him to like help, Yeah. So, like one of only one of the votes and they were like go back and get the rest and then uh -huh. he was like no and that was another reason. Yeah, the Emperor of Lilliput wants him to destroy Blefuscu, right? It's like no no, like don't just defeat them, right? All you've done is take their ships away. I want you to I want you to destroy this this country. I want you to destroy these people and render them a subject nation to us, right? And Gulliver argues against this. He's like, eh, no, like, like, I'm, I'm not going to be your instrument of destruction against another free nation. Right? You know, this, is, this is not. And the emperor pretends to agree with him, pretends to go along with it, but then comes up with this plan for neutralizing Gulliver while still making him useful. Right? And what is actually, what is the plan for neutralizing Gulliver? What are they, they're not going to kill him. They probably couldn't anyway. They're going to blind it, yeah. Their most merciful solution is to blind Let's Let's look at actually at the exact proposal here. Um, because it is um, bizarre. So if you look on page 66 here in Article 4. Can I get somebody to read for us the paragraph that starts, Upon this incident, Reldrasol, Principal Secretary. It's the, the last paragraph in page oh, okay. 66. Upon this incident, Belgesol, principal secretary for private affairs, who always approved himself a true friend, was commanded by the emperor to deliver his opinion, which he accordingly did, and therein justified the good thoughts he had of him. He allowed your crimes to be great, but that still, but that still there was room for mercy, the most commendable virtue in a prince, and for which his majesty was so justly celebrated. He said the friendship between you and him was so well known to the world that perhaps the most honorable board might think him partial. However, in obedience to the command he had received, he would freely offer his sentiments. That is, his majesty, in consideration of your services, and pursuant to his own merciful disposition, would please to spare your life, and only give words to put out both your eyes, and comfortably conceive that this, by this expedient, justice might in some measure be satisfied, and all the world would follow the unity of the emperor, as well as the fair and generous proceedings of those who have been honored to be in his council. Yep, keep going. That the loss of your eyes would be no impediment to your bodily strength, by which you might still be useful to his majesty. That blindness, in addition to courage, by concealing dangers from us, that the fear you have for your eyes is the greatest difficulty in reading over the enemy's fleet, and it would be sufficient for you to see by the eyes of the ministry since the greatest princes do no more. Thank you. So, yeah, so the idea here is that. If they take away his eyes, what does that then, how does that then affect their relationship with Gulliver? Why, why do they think taking away his eyes is going to improve things? It'll take away his fear. Okay, it'll take away his fear, right? He won't be, yeah, um, what have we noted before about Gulliver's eyes? Where do they always try to shoot him for one thing? His face. They always try to shoot him in the other. They're always trying to shoot him in the eyes, right? He always puts his spectacles on. Yeah, he protects himself by putting on his glasses. Right, so he acknowledges that he has the glasses on the one hand because he has weak vision. Yeah, the eyes are the weak points that his enemies always aim for.
Now we might also think about this in relation, again, to the way Gulliver appears to the Lilliputians and the way that um, they appear to him, right? So because Gulliver is a person of is, is a person of what we regard as normal height, like roughly six feet tall. And the Lilliputians are only six inches tall. How does everything look to him on Lilliput? It's probably fuzzy. Yeah, small, indistinct, and far away, right? Yeah, it's hard, it's likely hard for him to see things clearly on Lilliput because everything looks like he's looking at it from a distance. Even though, because everything's small, distances are actually kind of deceptive, right? So, you know, when he talks about the size of their city, um, you know, it's like maybe like, like about 40 feet all around, but to them, that's miles, right? But yeah, everything to him here looks far away, looks distant, looks small. Whereas, um, in part two, which we're not going to be reading, like, because the Brobdingnagians are so huge, all of their features and faults look enormous to him. Right? So like, he notices, for example, cancerous tumors on people's skin that they're probably completely unaware of. So <clears throat> here on Lilliput, his eyes are weak, and they have to be protected. Indeed, um, the recommended method of surgery for removing his eyes is that yeah, the emperor is just going to have a bunch of a bunch of soldiers um, <laughs> come up and shoot him in the eyes. Right? That's the humane operation that they are going to uh, use to deprive him of his vision. Well, you know, he when, said they heard his name, like, like he felt the sting in his hand. Yeah, yeah. And, and, I, that's what we're and the tissue in your eyes, right, is not the same as the, the tissue on the tissue in your skin, right? It's softer and it's weaker and um, it's much more easily damaged. Right? Like, you know, so, so like if, if somebody, you know, If somebody say like you know cuts your skin with a knife, right? That's gonna heal. That's gonna close up, right? If somebody sticks a knife in your eye, not that I'm not, not that I'm hoping you have, not that I expect that any of you ever had this experience, and I hope that you ever do, right? But if someone sticks a knife in your eye, is that gonna heal up? Not in a way that's gonna allow you to see again, right? This actually might put us in mind of another episode from an earlier reading. Yeah. Uh huh. Take a book out of Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right. It's yeah. We're, we, we, this is not the first time we've seen a giant with weak vision, right? Or with people who want to put out a giant's eye, right? In fact, there's even um, you know an episode um, early in Gulliver's Adventures on the Island, right, where he makes like he's going to eat one of the little people who's threatening him, but then instead he cuts the guy's bonds and just puts him down, right? You know, there you go, run away, little friend. Um, so, how is the Odysseus Polyphemus situation reversed here, though? Perspective are we seeing things in the opposite? The yeah, here we're seeing the giant's perspective, right? And granted, you know, this is a giant who is not an inhospitable people, right? But yeah, in most respects, the situation here is it's analogous, but it's reversed, right? 
Gulliver isn't the host here, he's the guest. He's, he's washed up on the island. Um, and he is also not the threat, he's the one who's threatened. So, his monstrous size and everything that goes along with it make him terrified, even though he intends no harm, right? And what else is he doing that is like, that is perhaps harmful to Lilliput, but, you know, not intentional? Yeah, he requires enormous amounts of food and wine, right? Don't like, officials do mention that, though. Cause yeah. How and much in fact, money requires. I think it, it's important to know too the two um, officials in the court who are most opposed to him, right, are the High Admiral, who he embarrasses by defeating Wolfescu by himself. So the High Admiral is opposed to him because Gulliver basically did his job for him. And the treasurer. because they just can't afford to keep feeding this guy, right? The amount of food it takes to keep him going is just too great. He is too great a tax on their resources. Even if he's not a nasty, vicious people-eating giant. So there are elements to this beyond the political allegory, right? So we can find this kind of point-by-point -point political allegory um, and stop there and call it quits there, right? But then we also see this influence of classical literature and of the discourse of the monstrous, right? You know, what is a monster in this case? Well, a monster is someone freakishly large who eats all your food, right? who is difficult to contain, whose piss and shit are genuine ecological problems, simply because of the sheer volume of them, right? So probably the most fantastic element of this is Gulliver himself, right? And Gulliver himself seems to be uh, drawn from if we look at his background what in 18th century British terms would be called a uh, dissenting rationalist philosophical and religious position, right? So, do any of you know what a dissenter is? Someone who disagrees? Um, in general terms. In specifically uh, British religious terms. Anybody know what a dissenter is? Go against the church, like for the Anglican yeah. Church, a Catholic would be considered a dissenter, or even a heretic. Well, no, probably considered them more heretic. Uh, you're thinking along the, along the right lines, but Catholics would have been a separate faction who did not align themselves with dissenters. So dissenters are non-Anglican Protestants. are inheritors in part of the Puritan tradition in British religion. Though they certainly would not be called uh, Puritans anymore by 6, 1726. By 1726, there's no such thing as a Puritan. Um, but um, like Unitarians, 
Baptists, uh, Methodists, right? Basically, anyone who's a pro uh, Presbyterians, pretty much anyone who is a Protestant but not an Anglican would be a dissenter, right? And dissenters were associated in particular with um, certain institutions. So if we look at Gulliver's account of himself before his voyages begin, page 21, my father had a small estate in Nottinghamshire. I was the third of five sons. He sent me to Emmanuel College in Cambridge at 14 years old where I resided myself three years and applied myself close to my studies. So Cambridge, the University of Cambridge generally, and Emmanuel College specifically, were noted for <clears throat> being centers of dissenting thought and also for being centers of philosophical rationalism. Now, does anybody know what rationalism is in philosophy? It's more empirical than thought. It's uh, believing more in what can be proven than what can not. Okay, yeah, um, a rationalist essentially believes that, certain, that laws of the universe can be proven, right? And that those laws are predictable and constant, and that they always work the same way, right? So a rationalist believes that the universe works according To consistent laws and through observation and experiment you can figure out what those laws are so like the key text like some of the key texts for rationalists aren't so much um, philosophical texts as they are often like mathematical texts um, so you know Newton's uh, Account of the, yeah, Newton's account of the cosmos, right, and is a big deal for rationalists. Right? It shows that the planets all move in predictable orbits, it measures what those orbits are, and attaches everything to the mathematical law, right? So, dissenters are often accused both of skepticism and of optimism, right? So skepticism, because of their general lack of faith in um, existing institutions, and optimism, because of their belief in consistent systems that run everything. So what we're going to see in this particular text, and yeah, it's it wasn't supposed to rain again today, but there we go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no. like, yeah, yeah, like when I was looking at the weather report, it said that like 13% chance of rain. So I was like, okay, that those don't, yeah, those don't seem like bad odds, but yeah, here we are. What's that? Yeah, well, I guess it began a little early, but I can already see the sun coming out behind there too, so. Down harder on this side. Yeah. 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 Let's see. I said sunlight clouds that are like that. That means nothing around here, right? It's, <laughs> that's it. You, you, you cannot predict the weather simply by looking outside, unfortunately. Okay, so one more thing. Uh, we got about 10 minutes. One more thing I want to cover uh, before I let you all go.
because I think this is something that is also going to help us with the voyage to the winds, right? Is that in addition to all of these um, elements of British religion and politics and philosophy that Swift intends to satirize, he is also drawing on a literary tradition. called The Traveler's Tale. And this is something that goes back, arguably, to classical Greece. Um, but Swift's own um, influences are a little bit more um, recent, relatively speaking. So probably the first, um, the first, the first like really uh, solid example of this kind of text to take off is the Book of the Marvels of the World. written by a Venetian merchant named Marco Polo in the late 13th century. So Polo had traveled as part of a trading expedition to China. And because he had a, a, a facility for learning languages, um, he learns Chinese very quickly, ingratiates himself uh, with the Chinese emperor's court, and undertakes missions um, she's going to like, go out and explore and describe uh, the emperor's dominions that he doesn't have time to visit himself, right? So Polo's um, account is often a slightly confused. He doesn't always understand what he's seeing, but he's also not making shit up. So, for example, uh, he talks about a creature that he calls a unicorn, but this unicorn has um, heavy gray skin uh, with these kind of like armor-plated scales. And its horn, rather than being in the middle of its forehead, is at the end of its snout. Do you know what he's describing? Yeah, it's a rhinoceros, right? But he, having no concept of what a rhinoceros is, right, he describes it in terms of this other creature from mythology that he is familiar with. So, he's just like, so they have unicorns there, but they don't, look, they don't look the way we think they do, right? Columbus describing a manatee as a mermaid. Uh, yeah, exactly, yeah. I guess, you know, if, if you're drunk and you're yeah. <laughs> Okay. Now, in the 14th century, a book attributed to a guy by the name of Sir John Mandeville appears, which purports to describe his travels around the world. Now, unlike Polo, John Mandeville is probably not a real person. And the travels he describes are completely made up. So this is the kind of book like where you have people landing on islands uh, where, say, like people have their faces in their chests rather than having heads. Or, you know, you, 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 you land on an island full of people with dogs' heads um, and human bodies, right? So pure, kind of like made-up fantasy places. And he will often describe the history and customs of the people of that place, right? Again, a completely invented, made-up history, a completely made-up society. But this book is enormously popular and hugely influential. And then the most recent example of these, when Swift is writing in 1726, is a book by William Dampier called A New Voyage Around the World. Published in 1697. 
So Dampier was a British sea captain um, who spent a good bit of time exploring the area around Australia. In fact, like this is one of the reasons, I think, why Swift situates Lilliput near Tasmania. Right, the last, identif the last identifiable piece of uh, land in the real world that Gulliver notes um, is Van Diemen's land, which is now Tasmania, near Australia. Right? So the same part of the world that Dampier kind of specialized in. Um, but Dampier's book is full of anecdotes about culture and food and about plant life and social life. Uh, one of the things that makes Dampier noteworthy is that he is the first European uh, to describe the process of making guacamole. So these traveler's tales, kind of like both fantastic and realistic, and even the realistic ones are often kind of fantastic as well, right? Um, form the basis for Swift's overall narrative. Right, the idea being to sell the homebound or landbound reader on the marvels of other places in the world that they will probably never see. And what Swift is adding to this is a kind of uh, philosophical and political discourse that is usually absent from these kinds of texts. Okay, so I think we're about out of time. Um, 137, okay, so yeah, we, we, are, we are close to time. Um, does anybody have any questions about this? Yeah, Bethany. Yes, I have a question about the world building. About the what? The world building. Yeah, sure. Okay, yeah, so go by what it says on the other sheet, because I think that when I made an upload of the syllabus, not all of you had added this class yet. That's Grace. That's Grace. Oh, well, she gets Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, yes, yes, um, yeah, go by, go by what I gave you on the sheet, because that, that's, that's what's, what I know is absolutely correct. Any other questions about the world building exercise, about homework, about any of this stuff? All right, see you Monday.